Hello everyone and welcome to Kerbal Space Program, episode 6 of SSTO Space Program. Today we will focus on long-term habitation and survivability to prepare ourselves for interplanetary journeys and also finally make some serious preparations to colonize the moon. There is a little surprise for you at the end, although you might have guessed what it is already. We are at the point where we can basically send missions to the moon as we please, and it's a good thing, since we are getting a lot of contracts requiring us to go there, and also there's still plenty of science left to be collected from the lunar surface. Unfortunately, most of those contracts require um, readings from areas that give us no science, so I decided to test some alternative solutions to this problem. For our first mission, we're sending our Angel SSTO with a remote-controlled probe to perform some contract readings on the surface. The probe might be slightly inspired by Star Wars, but basically it's a um, science container with a monopropellant tank and a bunch of batteries, science instruments and an antenna all slapped together. It's a small little contraption that is fun to fly. Nevertheless, as fun as it may be, it's not something that we can leave on the surface and reuse later, since once monopropellant runs out, it's pretty much useless. So I took all the required readings and brought it back to KSC. For our next mission, I wanted to see if we can build an SSTO that will be able to keep our Kerbals relatively well fed and happy long enough to go to Duna or EVE. Our space station has proven very useful in this regard, so I decided to use a very similar design for crew compartment and make an SSTO that will have more than enough Delta V to go to Duna and back. It would carry three Kerbals to ensure that they have plenty of living space, and uh, I also decided to put a cupola as it provides a very high hub modifier. I also like to use cupolas as command modules for my spaceships because they provide great visibility and uh, offer some spectacular views. It was a big mistake however, as you will see in a moment. Also, we cannot really pack enough supplies for our Kerbals without making our SSTO impractically large. Fortunately, MKS adds greenhouses and recyclers that allow growing food using fertilizer and mulch, which cuts the required weight factor by about 8. So I added two small greenhouses on top of our SSTO to see how the whole thing will behave and function. To sum up, we have a hitchhiker's can, which is a habitat, a laboratory, which is a life support slash recycler module, two greenhouses for food production, and a cupola as a command module and a hub extender for our ship. To test this ship, I decided to send it to the moon with a tiny rover that this time we are going to leave on the surface. My idea was that we are going to pick up some science from a new location on the moon and leave the rover there to serve us as an in-situ probe in case some more contracts pop up in the future requiring us to take some readings. This way we won't need to send yet another mission to the same location again. Also, Moon is close enough that if anything goes wrong, we can always go back to Kerbin in under one day, so there is no risk involved for our Kerbals. This SSTO has over 4000 meters per second delta V while in orbit, plus some excess oxidizer for more efficient landing and takeoff, so a trip to the Moon is a walk in the park really. I named this SSTO Artemis for, um, you know, reasons, but uh, I think it's a fitting name. If you think that we should name it differently, however, please let me know in the comments below. After getting into orbit, I checked our fuel levels and prepared our brave crew for transmonar injection burn. During the burn, that was executed in two passes, I also checked how our Kerbals were doing with regards to their hub and supplies level. I didn't know that the habitat for our cupola module had to be started as well, and that actually changed our stats slightly. Nevertheless, we had around 227 days of hub time and were growing supplies almost as fast as we were consuming them. So our team was buckled up and ready for the trip. In the meantime, I realized that our space station was not generating enough power because now it was consuming a lot more due to the research it was conducting. Without power, the habitats were not working, recyclers were off, and suddenly our station team was much less happy about staying in space. I therefore decided to send our station building a SSTO that you guys decided to name Ragnarok to add a bunch of huge solar panels to solve the power shortage problem. It was a very light payload, so getting into orbit was not a problem, but the problem I was left with was assembly. There were multiple ways I could have done this, but I decided to stick to stock solutions as much as possible, so I split the solar array into three pieces and connected them in orbit using docking ports. Each arm had its own detachable probe that was doing the assembly. I wanted to deorbit them once everything was finished, but as usual I forgot to pack parachutes, so they were left on the station. Maybe they will find some use in the future. 
Now, with so many powerful solar panels in place and some extra batteries as well, our station is no longer in risk of running out of power. Kerbals on the station are happy again, so it's time to deorbit our Ragnarok SSTO and direct our attention to Artemis that is now preparing to land on the moon. We still haven't explored many biomes on the moon and this time I decided to land in the far side crater. Artemis is a nice ship with relatively high thrust to weight ratio in nuclear mode, plus it has a lot of excess oxidizer that can be used for rapid acceleration or deceleration if needed. Also, we have almost 1000 meters per second delta V extra with this ship, so landing can be executed relatively carelessly, you don't need to worry about efficiency that much. As you can see, I was rather careful about it and cancelled my horizontal velocity at relatively high altitude and continued with powered descent to the surface. I also picked a really bad landing spot, highly inclined and uh, for the moment that uh, I couldn't stop the vessel from sliding down the hill. I had to use my engines to stop it, and once it was done, I sent a Kerbal out to unscrew the rover. The rover has a small monopropellant tank and a bunch of thrusters, so it has limited flying capabilities on the moon, which hopefully will allow it to get through difficult terrain more easily. It's also equipped with a bunch of science instruments that we will hopefully use in the future as well. In the meantime, Artemis crew was conducting research on the surface of the Farsight crater because we still need more science to unlock some of the key technologies before we can start colonizing the moon. This time I sent two rookie carbonauts alongside with Jeb, so it was imperative that they plant a flag. And there should be something unusual about the picture you see right now. That's right, stock visual terrain makes scatter objects like rocks and trees solid and you can no longer face through them. Landing a plane in a forest is a whole new experience now. I learned that the hard way. Actually, taking off and landing an SSTO anywhere is a bit harder now, but fortunately I brought Jab with us. Anyway, all readings are taken and uh, we can now take off and head back to Kerbin. At this point I checked our supplies and it seemed that our Kerbals went consuming only a tiny bit more than they were growing. From the beginning of the mission they used only 20 supplies. It was a good sign, but we need more greenhouses nevertheless. Estimating how many is quite difficult however, considering all the modifiers provided by different recyclers and the number of crewmen affected by them, I guess um, we'll figure that out eventually, but it's getting complicated really quickly. On the other hand, I think Artemis is a pretty good ship design. Has a lot of Delta V, rather high cargo capacity, so we can absolutely add more greenhouses to it and maybe a uh, small crude rover. But most importantly, it doesn't look like a flying brick. However, there are two very important points about this design that I realized on our trip back. First, habitat on the cupola had to be started as well, and this changed the home and hub time for some of our crewmen from 220 days to indefinite. This is actually a very important discovery. Second, I've completely forgotten that uh, with the new heat model cupolas don't handle re-entry very well. They were doing okay before, but now um, because of their really low core heat resistance um, they explode pretty easily. I've managed to land the ship despite the unforeseen difficulties, but uh, we need to redesign it before we can send it to tuna. At this point, we are almost ready to start the colonization of the moon. Well, almost because we are missing many and colonists. MKS parts are pretty expensive and hiring new Kerbals isn't exactly cheap either. Luckily for us, we had another rescue mission to do and we still need more science, so I decided to send our tutorial SSTO to do both at the same time. What was interesting about the rescue mission is that the Kerbal was stranded in a retrograde orbit around the moon. This SSTO can easily deal with one objective, but not with two at once. It simply doesn't have enough delta V. Therefore, I designed a small rescue chair for our stranded Kerbal and thought this mission would be an interesting exercise in managing the mechanical energy of our spacecraft that you guys might enjoy. The rescue craft was deployed far away from the moon and its trajectory adjusted so it would enter a retrograde orbit akin to the one our stranded Kerbal was in. Then we needed to perform an insertion band. It was important for our rescue probe to enter a relatively high orbit around the moon lest we would lose communications with it, because I still don't have a comm network around the moon. Our SSTO needed to perform an insertion burn as well, and after picking a suitable landing spot, with the help of fancy scan maps obviously, we landed in the moon's east far side crater. 
Landing was easy as this SSTO was designed as a training ship and uh, is a bit over engineered to the point where you can actually take it to Duna and back without changing anything. Once we've landed our chief scientist Bob started collecting science data and planted a flag mainly for future reference. With all readings taken, Jep took the ship back into orbit where we would wait for our rescue probe to arrive, hopefully with our stranded Kerbal on board. At this point I realized something that I don't like about the life support mods. They render most of my smaller SSTOs pretty much useless for longer missions. It's a bit of a shame because I uh, have a couple of designs that I wanted to show you that you've never seen before that could easily go to Jewel System or ELU but with the life support, they can go there only as drones. Back to our rescue probe, it entered a highly eccentric orbit, mainly because we needed to adjust the inclination. Our stranded mishap was not only in a retrograde orbit, but also highly inclined. Changing your inclination at low velocity saves delta V, and you tend to have the lowest orbital velocity at apoapsis, or in this case aposceline, of highly eccentric orbit. Thank you Jane for explaining the terminology last time. Once our orbits were level, the probe performed standard rendezvous maneuver and getting our Kerbal bag was relatively easy. The rescue chair is widely over-engineered and has probably enough delta V to get back to Kerbin on its own, but let's assume it's not the case. We are in a retrograde orbit, while our SSTO is in a prograde orbit, so our relative velocity towards it as it passes by is twice the orbital velocity we currently have. That's a lot but we can change our orbit to prograde for a fraction of that velocity. We can do that simply by changing our orbit to highly eccentric again, almost at the edge of Moon's sphere of influence, where the kinetic energy of our spacecraft is very low. At this point, flipping our velocity vector requires only 145 meters per second. Getting back to a circular orbit our SSTO is in required another 160 meters per second, so we spent 465 meters per second total, which is less than the orbital velocity around the moon at 20 kilometers. I also decided to take the challenge and dock this craft back into the cargo bay with calculated engine burns, and um, I am happy to say that it worked. I guess I am one step closer to achieving manly level. With our Kerbal safely strapped to the seat in the back and the rescue craft docked in the cargo bay, there is little left for our crew than leave for Kerbin. Getting back to Kerbin was easy and we have more than enough Delta V to insert our spacecraft into a return trajectory and everything went smoothly. This SSTO is a pretty good training craft, so if you have problems with flying SSTO space planes yourself, go ahead and give it a try. We have now enough science to unlock everything we need to send a recon mission to the moon that will be the first step in the colonization process. For this mission I would like to send two pressurized rovers that will serve as a mobile outpost with relatively long hub capabilities. We are going to use them to find the best possible location for our future base. For that we need a new SSTO in our fleet. I decided to make a new SSTO that will be able to put 20 tons of cargo on the moon or tuna because why not? and we are going to use it to bring smaller modules and rovers for our future colony. It looks a little bit similar to my Sagittarius SSTO that you may remember from my other video, but it's a bit uh, bigger and has slightly higher cargo capacity. I am not overly happy with how it looks, but it gets the job done and uh, it's also quite easy to fly. Also, at this point I realized that the mission itself was cool enough to make a music video about it. So um, this is the surprise I had for you. You might have seen it already, but if you haven't, please go ahead and give it a watch. I hope you will enjoy. So thank you very much for watching. I really do hope that you liked this video. And if you did, please give it a like and leave a comment below. All your comments and likes are always very much appreciated. And it's something I genuinely care about, as it tells me that it's worth making those videos for you guys. Anyway, thank you very much. I'm Mark Frim, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.